Welcome to this sermon from Silver Lake Baptist Church. Our mission is to celebrate the greatness of God with all we are for the joy, hope, and renewal of our community. We are so glad you have chosen to listen to our message. We pray you will be blessed by your time with us today. Good morning. Have you ever caught yourself engaged in some sort of activity that you did without thinking about it at all? Maybe you woke up one morning, you're in a hurry to get to work, didn't get all the sleep out of your eyes, and you like put your keys in the refrigerator. <laughs> or you're looking for your glasses, but they're on top of your head. Or you can't find your cell phone that you're talking to your wife on. <laughs> I think we all engage in certain activities without giving them much thought. And one of those, which we might be hesitant to admit to in a church on a Sunday morning, Christmas time, is that we get in arguments, mindless arguments. Has anyone ever done that? And when we get in these mindless arguments, we have this mindless addiction to getting in the last word. Have you noticed that? And so I want to take a quick poll. We all have some sort of sparring partner, the person we have these discussions with. And if the sparring partner is here with you, you can't look at them before you answer. But when you're in these mindless discussions, who is more likely to get the last word? If you think it's you, go ahead and raise your hand. No one wants to admit to working to get the last word. I do see people trying to help each other raise their hand. <laughs> I see how that works. So I, th I think we, we all want to have the last word. We all want to be right. We all want to have that decisive answer. And I'm not the only one who's noticed this. The internet has caught on to this as well. So I have a few examples we can take a look at. Twitter is one of the places where people try to have the last word. And up until recently, Twitter only allowed 140 characters per post. So it's a great place to have a mindless argument because no one can fully articulate their position. So they state only like their emotional rage response in their 140 characters and they get in big mindless arguments. And you can see, if you search for Twitter, these are some of the results you get. The 10 most epic celebrity Twitter fights, 15 of the craziest celebrity Twitter feuds ever, and 22 celebrity Twitter feuds that went viral. So the, the internet knows people want to have the last word. And we have more examples. If you're familiar with memes, this is the grumpy cat meme. And the grumpy cat knows. Have the last word? No, you will not. Sometimes we're all kind of like the grumpy cat. Keep going, Aaron. This guy, maybe you've seen him before. Even back then, they wanted the last word. Next one. One does not simply have the last word on the internet. It's universal awareness is developing for this trend that everybody wants to have the last word. Keep going. Why you know let me have the last word? I can tell some of you haven't seen some of these memes before and some of you have. There's like a, a, an age demographic I'm <laughs> looking across as we go ahead, Aaron. Okay, this guy. I don't always comment on meme battles, but when I do, I get the last word and the win. Next one. Kermit the Frog is a more recent meme. I'm not even sure I understand all the permutations of this one that I've seen. But go ahead, you can have the last word. I'm sure it will only make my point further. <laughs> Another more recent one, the baby memes. This one. And I think there's one more, isn't there? That's it? OK. So the internet is aware. You want the last word. I want the last word. Everybody wants the last word. The question is why? Why are we so concerned about having the last word in our arguments, which are often mindless? I think it's because we want to be recognized as being the person who's right. We want to make that decisive statement so that as we carry on from this point forward in life, we're going to do things my way, my version of the truth, my facts. That's what I want to live by. We want to be recognized as being accurate, as being smarter than the people around us. And we want to complete the discussion on our own terms, right? We want to dictate the terms under which we're going to operate it. This morning, we're going to look at an instance in which God chose to have the last word, an instance in which God said, this is the way reality works. This is the way things really are. This is who I really am. And we'll see that, that people are continuing to talk, even though God has already had the last word. So if you have your Bible with you, go ahead and turn in it to John chapter 1. We're going to begin this morning in verse 14. So you're looking for John 1, 14. And as you're turning there, 
I want to ask you to pull out the little bookmark that's in your bulletin. And these are printed on some pretty glossy paper. So I noticed a lot of them were slipping out as you were handed your bulletin. So if you don't have one of these, I'd like you to have one. And I have some with me. Just let me know, and I'll hand you one right now. Anybody not have one and want one? These are going to help you with the message. So it's good that you have one. If not, I have more right up here. Okay? Let's pray as we head to John 1, 14. Heavenly Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege we have of looking into your last word on the truth, the final word, the authoritative word from the creator of the universe. And I ask as we read these words that we would humble ourselves before them, that we would recognize them as true even in areas where they conflict with our lives, even in areas where they conflict with our desire to be in charge of things. Help us to put you first. Help us to obey you and to honor you. And help us to remember why we're celebrating Christmas this year. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, John 1.14 says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. And I hope you notice that the word, word, is capitalized. That's kind of unusual. We don't usually capitalize the word, word. And you've probably heard somebody talking about this passage in the past in a Sunday school class or a sermon tell you that the word is capitalized because it's talking about Jesus, right? Does everyone loosely agree that the word is Jesus in this section? When we were talking about this section in our family devotions, I asked the question, how do you know that this is referring to Jesus? And someone who will remain anonymous answered, because the W is capitalized. And that's a good answer. That's a good use of the little hints that these people who translated the Bible for us have given us to help us know what's going on. But what if you're talking to someone who's a skeptic about this whole Jesus thing and a capital W isn't enough to convince them that the author really intended for us to understand the capital W word to be Jesus Christ? Is there more evidence that he's talking about Jesus? And there absolutely is. And we're going to talk about it tonight if you come back for the Christmas Eve service. But I'll give you a brief preview. If you look at the, the earlier section of this scripture that's famous, John 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, capitalized again, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So it, we know it's talking about God. The only question is which member of the Trinity are we talking about? And then you can look at verse 3. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. And so the question we have next is, is there somewhere else in Scripture that gives us a hint of who was an active agent in creation so we could know who the Word is? And if you look at Colossians 1.16, it says, For by him, speaking of Jesus clearly, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. All things were made through him, and without him, Nothing was made that was made. That's back in John. So it's Jesus. We're talking about Jesus, and I want to make sure no one has any doubts that when we read Word this morning, we're talking about Jesus. So the Word that became flesh and dwelt among us is Jesus Christ, God, putting on a human body and living here on earth among human beings, being tired and hungry and tempted, all the things that you and I experience as human beings. In Isaiah 7:14 it says, "Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold the virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel," which means God with us. Jesus is God coming to live with us. And why is he called the word? So if we're clear that it's Jesus, why is John calling Jesus the word? That is an unusual title to give a person. When we think of word, we think of communication. We think of an understanding of what's true, what's real, a description. And so what is it then that Jesus is revealing to us? What is the truth that he's communicating through his life? And we find the answer to that question in Hebrews chapter 1, where we read, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, 
and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So what is it that Jesus is revealing to the world? He's revealing God. He's helping us to know who God is. So when you read the capital word in John 1, recognize that what John's communicating to us is that God has revealed himself to the world in Jesus Christ. And in our verse here this morning, verse 14, it concludes that thought with the words, full of grace and truth. So when Jesus came to present this declaration of who God is, he came with grace and with truth. Jesus is the gracious and true message of God. Jesus is the gracious and true message of God. And if you have one of the bookmarks, look at the sky side where it says grace on top. Grace is a church word that I think we hear a lot on Sunday mornings and not very much anywhere else. So I'm not sure we all have a common definition of what grace is. And one of my goals in making this bookmark was to help us have a common definition of what grace is. A long time ago, someone came up with an acronym for grace, God's Riches at Christ's Expense. You see that at the top. And then I wanted to communicate some of what it is that we've been given at Christ's expense. We have the riches of heaven open before us because of what Jesus Christ did on our behalf. And if you look down the bookmark, you'll see a bunch of examples. And we'll cover some of those later in the message. But, but I want us to have this as a common point of reference as far as what grace is. Jesus is the gracious and true message of God. Then take a look at verse 15. John bore witness of, witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. Okay, there's something here that doesn't make a lot of sense. The last part of that verse, let me read it again. He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. The afters and befores in that sentence, or half of a sentence, don't really make sense. So John the Baptist is saying Jesus came after him. And we can think of that as obviously true in two senses. The first is, remember, John is Jesus' older cousin. And we know from the gospel accounts that John was born about six months before Jesus. So just in the common, literal human sense, John came before Jesus. Six months before Jesus, John was born. And then when we think of their public ministry, right, they both appeared on the religious scene of their generation within a, a short window of each other, but John first. John had the public ministry before Jesus did. Remember, he was out baptizing people and crowds were coming to him. We talked about this last week. He had such an impact on the religious community of his day that the religious authorities sent out people to question him to figure out what was going on. And we talked about last week that when this happened, he said, he who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. So it is true that Jesus came after John, but it's also true that he was before him. And that's a pretty remarkable thing to consider. How can you exist before someone who was born six months before you? I have some older cousins, and all of them were here before me. All of them existed before me. That's a distinct difference between Jesus Christ and Chuck Orr. Jesus always was. Remember, as he's talking about Jesus, he says, last week, we just covered this, he was not worthy to loosen the sandals of Jesus Christ. John said, I'm not worthy to be the lowest servant in the house of Jesus. And so when, when he's saying, he who comes after me is preferred before me, he's reminding the world of his day, the people around him, of a reality that you and I, due to our privileged place in history, are reminded of over and over again in the Bible, but it was be being revealed to them in real time. Remember this Jesus he's talking about is the one Isaiah wrote about when he said, The Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That's Isaiah 7. In Isaiah 9, verses 6 and 7, we read, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom, 
to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. And we also read last week from Isaiah 53. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The punishment for our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. And many of you will remember the story in John 8, when Jesus was confronted by the Pharisees, and they pointed out to him that he was not yet 50 years old, but he was talking about Abraham having seen him. And do you remember what his response was? Assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. This is the truth that John's pointing out. There was never a time in the history of humanity when Jesus Christ did not exist. We were created by him and through him. So when John's saying, this guy who came after me is preferred before me, he's saying he is of such a higher rank than me. He is so much more worthy than me. Colossians 1.16, which I read earlier, For by him all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. Philippians chapter 2 says, God gave, highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the introduction that John is making for Jesus. He was there when the first elements of creation were called into existence. And when we go to the end of history, he'll be there too. We see that in Revelation chapter 5. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the scroll and to loose its seven seals. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation and have made us kings and priests to our God and we shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne, the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. So these people listening to John the Baptist are getting a real introduction to who Jesus Christ is for the first time. And you and I take that for granted. All those verses that I just read have been in your Bible since you were a little kid. Before you were even born, they were there written down for us to, to come to and to understand that Jesus is the revelation of who God is. All these amazing things that we talk about are true of Jesus, and it's so easy for us to just think of him as the little baby on Christmas morning. But he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the one who could say before Abraham was, I am. Jesus is worthy of greater honor, respect, and allegiance than any leader. Jesus is worthy of greater honor, respect, and allegiance than any leader. And this addresses the questions they were really asking John, right? The reason they wanted to talk to John is to find out why he was stealing their people. Why are, are you getting greater allegiance than we are? Why are you getting respect that belongs to us? And, and he turns the whole thing to Jesus and points out the one who's worthy of respect, the one who's worthy of honor is the one who created us who existed before Abraham, who uses the title I am, revealing himself to be God for himself. This is the one you should be worried about respecting, not yourselves. Don't be worried about me. Worry about the guy who's come to turn everything upside down and give people a path to relationship with God. Verse 16. And of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. So Jesus coming into the world brought something for us as well. And I want to point out, look at verse 14 again, and then quickly back down to verse 16. At the end of verse 14, he said that Jesus was full of grace and truth. And then here in 16, he says, Of his fullness we have all received, and grace for grace. And 
there's a point here that's being repeated. So it's worth looking into a little more deeply. What is it that he's trying to communicate? And that is the completeness of Jesus Christ. There was no lack. He was completely full of grace and completely full of truth. There was no deception in any of the words Jesus said. There was always grace, giving people things that they could never have earned for themselves. God's riches at Christ's expense come to us through Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. And so, again, referring to that, that grace bookmark, I want us to consider some of the things that we have. We have redemption and forgiveness of sin. And you can see the verses on your bookmark. 1 Peter 1.18, Ephesians 1.7, Colossians 3.13. We have an inheritance in heaven that cannot be taken away from us. If you're a child of God through Jesus Christ, you are an heir of all the awesome things in heaven that God has prepared for us. You have the Holy Spirit living inside you and you have direct access to God. Ephesians 1.13 and Hebrews 4.14-16. 4, and I realize Hebrews 4 may not be as familiar a passage, so go ahead and turn there with me. Hebrews 4, and I'm going to read verses 14 through 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And I'm sure many of us have heard and maybe even memorized Hebrews 4.16, that you can approach the throne of God with confidence. But back up a little bit and consider why it is. You can't approach the throne of God with confidence because of how awesome you are, because of how intelligent you are, because of how popular you are. You can approach the throne of God with confidence because Jesus paid the price for your sin. Jesus took away everything that was separating you from God. Jesus made it possible for sinful people like us to stand in the presence of a holy God. That is an incredible privilege that's easy to take for granted, but we have it because of Jesus coming into our world as a baby and living a pure, holy, sinless life. And he's full of that. There's no lack in his capacity to give us these good things that we do not deserve. Jesus is the limitless source of every good gift. Jesus is the limitless source of every good gift. When I was a kid, we used to have a little more Christmas celebration in public schools than we do now. And there would even be like a Santa guy who would come and you know, visit with the classroom, probably the, the teacher's husband, I don't know. But there was some Santa Claus representative who would come to the class and they would have their bag of stuff, right? And the big concern was always, what's inside that bag? As a kid, I want to know what's in the gift bag. And I was also like calculating based on the size of the bag how many gifts were in there and how big they could possibly be. Right? So if there's 30 kids in the class and he's only got a bag that's like the size of a purse, my odds aren't very good. Because first of all, whatever he's got is pretty small and he probably doesn't have enough for everybody. And I think that's a concern that carries on into adulthood, right? When we come to this time of year in the business world, people are really interested in bonuses, right? And so when I become aware of kind of some of the bonus numbers that leadership people are throwing around, it's not hard to do the math to figure out where that's roughly going to end up for everybody. And I know based on how big the pie is, roughly how big everybody's piece of the pie is going to be. And so everybody starts to get concerned around their, their piece of pie. Is there going to be enough pie for me? And what John is revealing to us repeatedly about Jesus Christ is there's no lack. When you come to Jesus for help because your life is broken and you've tried to live it your own way and you don't have hope anymore, he's not going to run out of grace for you. When you live a life and you see people around you living lives that are based on lies and they desperately need the truth, and you desperately need the truth, Jesus Christ is not going to run out of truth. There's enough for you. And he invites you to come to it over and over again, to read his book, to get to know him and have this truth revealed to you. Jesus is the limitless source of every good gift. 
Verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And you can imagine the effect these words would have on a largely Jewish audience. That Moses wasn't just like a pretty good guy. Moses wasn't like a pastor that everybody liked on the radio. Moses was the guy who founded their faith. And so when he compares Jesus to Moses, it's clear to them that he's not talking about another itinerant preacher. He's not talking about somebody who had some moral authority or somebody who was a little bit wiser than the rest of his peers. He's setting him up as the leader, the one to be listened to. And he says, Moses came and brought the law to us, but Jesus came and brought us grace and truth. And in contrasting those two things, we see how Moses came to point the way to Jesus. Paul calls the law a tutor to bring us to Jesus Christ. Because when we see the law, we see God's holy, perfect standard, we notice something about ourselves right away. There's this list of rules, and I can't follow any of these rules for more than about 10 minutes. So how can I live in relationship with the God who made these rules? It becomes apparent that I can't. There must be someone else, someone else who doesn't have the limits that I do, who can fulfill this list of rules perfectly in my place. Because if there isn't, I have no hope. And so at Christmas time, we're celebrating the reason we have hope is someone did step into our place. Someone who was perfect and limitless, who fulfilled all the requirements of a holy God, and then took the weight of our sin on himself and put that holy, righteous life on our account. Jesus is the limitless source of every good gift. And we'll conclude this morning in verse 18. It says, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, He has declared Him. Jesus reveals God to us. And I talked at the beginning of the message about this idea that human beings are still talking about who God is. Have you noticed that? There's a lot of ideas out there that you can read or watch on TV or listen to on the radio about who God is. There are almost as many theories about who God is as there are human beings. And I want you to think for a minute about how you feel when someone misrepresents you. Have you ever had that experience? Someone saying something about you that you felt was untrue? Or maybe something that was blatantly untrue and everybody knew it, except the little audience that was listening to this person talk? How do you feel about that? I don't like it, but I think we all encounter it. And if you're really honest, I know this is maybe a little painful to admit, it really doesn't matter what people think about you. It has no impact on their life. In most cases, has minimal impact on their life or your life. But what if people are misrepresenting the God of the universe who created you and me and everything in this world? What if people are misrepresenting the one way you can know that God? What if people are misrepresenting the difference between heaven and hell? What if people are misrepresenting the difference between truth and lies? That's what's happening in our world. People are communicating facts about God that are untrue. And in Jesus Christ, we find the answer to all of those lies. God has revealed himself for who he really is in Jesus Christ. Who has heard the word exegesis before? It's, it's a super churchy word. I apologize for that. It, it comes from Greek, and it, it means taking the meaning out of a text, interpreting it, understanding it, developing the meaning so it can be revealed to others. And that's an important thing to do if you want to faithfully teach the word of God. And you've probably also heard the opposite, because I almost never hear exegesis mentioned without the opposite, which is eisegesis, which would be to put meaning in to the word. Do you see the danger and why we try to avoid that? If I had something in mind that I wanted to talk to you about on Christmas Eve morning, and I just took that and forced it over the Bible and just looked for verses to support what I wanted to say, do you see how dangerous that could be? And you see examples of this like on paid Christian television people making hundreds of millions of dollars, to make the Bible say something that it doesn't really say. So that word exegesis about taking meaning out of what's really here and revealing it to the people around us, the root for that word is in this last verse that we're reading. Verse 18, it's really cool. 
No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. The Greek word that's translated declared is exegisato. And that is exegesis. That's the same word. That, that's where the word comes from in English. And so Jesus is doing exegesis on God to humanity. Jesus is extracting the meaning of who God is, what he's done, for human beings to understand. And he put it in a package that we could relate to. He came in a human body like ours so we could know and love and understand him. Jesus is the ultimate and exclusive revelation of God to man. Jesus is the ultimate and exclusive revelation of God to man. Two key words in that sentence, ultimate and exclusive. Ultimate means the best, the final. There needs to be no more. Everything you need to know about God, you can learn from Jesus. And so if you want to know God better, open the first four books of your New Testament and read the Gospels. Read them through. You can do that in just a few hours, all four of them. And you'll know God better than you do before you read them. So read the Gospels. Get familiar with them. Love them. Understand who Jesus is and live in relationship with him. Secondly, it says that he's the exclusive revelation of God to man. Has anyone ever had a friend that said, like, nature is their church or something like that? The idea being that I'm getting my revelation of God from my self-selected group of sources, whether it's a tree or a river or my friend down the street. That's how I choose to know God. Lots of people believe that and say things like that, but that's not the source of revelation that God chose for himself. So if you don't like it when people gossip about you and miscommunicate who you are to the world around you, why would you do that to the God who made us? Why would you accept a source other than the one he gave us in understanding who he is and what he's done and how much he loves us? John 14, 6, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Everybody remembers that. Do you remember the last part of the verse? No one comes to the Father except through me. It's exclusive. And our world doesn't love that. It's not a popular message. But if you want to know God, you have to come through Jesus Christ. You can write all the books you want, have all the radio programs and TV programs you want. But if you're just using the Bible and your ideas about God to make money and not communicating who Jesus Christ is and what he's done, you're lying. You're not doing what God put us here on the earth to do. Jesus is the exclusive revelation of God to man. So what does that mean? When it comes to knowing who God is, somebody else got the last word. And I hate to break it to you. You don't get the last word on who God is. But I'm thankful for that. Because if I got the last word on who God is, the God in my world would be a God that I made in my own image. He would have the same weaknesses that I have. He would have the same likes and dislikes that I have. And that would not be God. That would be a projection of Chuck onto the universe. And that's a scary, ugly thing. And I hope that each of you can admit the same of yourself. If you create God in your own image, you cannot do that without limiting who the real God is and redefining him and making up lies about who he is and what he's done. You come up with a God who overlooks the sins that you commit, but is really concerned about the sins that everyone else commits. You come up with a God who only says things that you're comfortable with. But if, if that's who God is, there's no change for you. There's no heaven for you. There's no separation from sin for you because he's just the guy you made up. So we have good news this morning. The good news is we don't get the last word. You and I get to know who God really is. Not the God we would make up for ourselves. Not a God who's molded into our image. But the real king, the real creator of the universe, who stepped into our world as a baby so that we could know a God who created this world and everything in it, who was here from eternity past and will be here when this world runs down. That's who we celebrate on Christmas morning. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for all the riches of heaven that come to us through him. Thank you that I can stand here and talk to you as a sinful man who doesn't deserve any of this. But because of Jesus, I can come and talk to the God of heaven. I thank you for it, and I thank you that that's true for all of us. 
I ask as we go our separate ways this Christmas Eve morning that we would bring this message with us, that there's one God, there's one way to know him, and there's real hope in admitting that as much as I want the last word, I don't deserve it because I don't know what I need to know to reveal God to others apart from Jesus Christ. Help us to know, love, and celebrate Jesus Christ in everything we do. It's in his name and for his glory that we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for listening. If you'd like to learn more about us, check out our website at www.silverlakebaptist.org.